London. In the 21st century, London is a busy, modern, international capital, with all the traits of a sophisticated, up-to-the-minute, connected conurbation. Evidence of its modernity is simply everywhere, from the stylish high-rise to the transport infrastructure, which is being updated all the time, to the way this capital leads in the fields of popular culture, fashion, filmmaking and lifestyle. But appearances can be deceptive. Despite all this ultra-modern architecture everywhere, London has a really rich history dating right back to Roman times and before. And at its heart, the city has a dark medieval presence. And that's because just about 1,000 years ago, this city went through a major upheaval. And for the only time in its history since those days, London was invaded and it was transformed by a force of hard-minded warriors whose brutal behaviour totally shaped the character of this place. The Norman invaders put their stamp on London and made sure that no one ever again was going to get away with what they had achieved. But you have to hand it to them because the building that most symbolises their rule of law or should I say their rule of terror, is still here today. Right at the heart of the city is the Tower of London. Today, the Tower of London is one of the world's most famous tourist attractions. But within these stone walls lies another world, a dark past full of diabolical treachery and deadly ambition, a place of imprisonment, torture and agonising death. These stones echo with the weeping of prisoners, the cries of the condemned and the tales they have to tell. Built by Norman conquerors, the Tower of London was the source of power over England. Across a thousand years, the fortress has been the home of kings and queens, a vault for their treasures and a prison for their foes. Over the centuries, the tower has had many uses, but to begin with, its primary purpose was to act as a safe haven for the conquering Normans somewhere where they could demonstrate their might to the cowering Saxons and at the same time provide a safe place for them to lay their heads at night. In the background you can see the two pinnacles on the top of the corner towers of the White Tower yeah. and then coming towards us this tower on the corner is on the line of the first curtain wall, Henry right. III's curtain wall and then the wall here, the outer wall, is his son Edward I's wall. So what was and the that's purpose the, of this curtain wall here? Then? The curtain wall is a protection to create an enclosure so that an attacker will capture, may capture the first wall, then finds themselves in a trap because there is a wall behind and there's, there's a killing ground between. The river is really central to London for trade and communications. Downstream, it opens out into the North Sea and the continent is so near. And most English trade until the 16th, 17th century was obviously with Northern Europe. But it's also strategic because it allows a defense of London. It acts as a moat for London on this side, whereas Southwark on that side I'm afraid, would be left to its own devices, which is actually what happened in 1554. Yeah. And London Bridge, the old London Bridge, was a defensive feature because right. it could be manned. Yeah. And an enemy bringing ships upstream cannot pass it. And while they're attempting to 
break the line of the bridge, their flank is exposed to the tower. So it's the two elements together in the Middle Ages which provide a defence for London. And made this virtually impregnable. It makes it impregnable. It's, it's only way if the garri garrison goes absent without leave or, or simply loses heart that it, it could be captured. Tower Bridge and the Tower of London really are centuries apart, but the bridge was built in the style which the late Victorians thought was the true Gothic medieval style. Tower Bridge is finished in 1894. Uh, it really was needed as a lower crossing, a, f a crossing further downstream as the East End developed. And it was built and finished in this Gothic style. At the time there was conservation concerns yeah. that it would dominate the tower. But because it was built in this style, it quickly seemed to blend in and the two are now regarded as inseparable. Whereas of course this is really a very late arrival in the history of the tower. Uh, but the tower that, that's projecting is St Thomas's Tower and within St Thomas's Tower is what became known as Traitor's Gate. It was the water gate of the tower and it is where high status prisoners would be brought because they wouldn't be brought through the city and across Tower Hill. They would have the privacy of arriving by boat and they would land there. And so that designation as Traitor's Gate gradually was given to the entrance through St Thomas's Tower. Behind that is the Bloody Tower, which was its predecessor as the Watergate, which was used as a prison. The river came much higher. Tower Wharf is reclaimed ground. The um, Cradle Tower, just in front of us, had the moat immediately in front of it and just a narrow strip of ground in front of that, between it and the river. The River Thames because of embanking over the centuries, but particularly in the 19th century, and then a little bit additionally in the 20th century, the Thames is narrower than it has ever been. And so the flow on it of the water downstream is faster. The White Tower really is the hub of the tower. It's where originally the Royal Apartments were and where the original arsenal of weapons was kept. A defender could afford to lose control of the outer wards, but could still retain the White Tower. You would have thought it was impregnable. It had one entrance, and that was a narrow one. And so, yes, I mean, that really is the heart of the tower. It's the oldest surviving part, but it's also still the heart of it. In the 11th century, the tower represented control. Whoever had the tower had control of London, and therefore the country. It was impregnable, and even more than that, it symbolised the majesty and strength of being in charge. People all over the country spoke in awe about the White Tower. It was the ultimate statement of ownership. The battle over the tower, and the control it symbolised, claimed many victims over the centuries, the greedy and the treacherous, and even on occasion the innocent, paid a heavy price in the struggle for power. As the fear of the tower spread, so too did the stories of what went on down those dark corridors. The losers in the struggle for power ended up in prison, in a cell in the tower, and for most, the only way out was execution. But there was something even worse than death. And that was the art of torture. At the tower, it was taken to a ridiculously high level, with no limit to how long they might incarcerate you for, and no limit to what devilish deeds they might carry out. Carefully written rules of torture were used. First, Tell the victim the threat. Then show the implement. Prepare the victim slowly. Strip the victim. Give them a taste of physical discomfort. Then take them to the tools of the torturer. Then finally inflict unimaginable pain. The tools of the torture trade 
was sophisticated. When using the dreaded rack, the victim's arms and legs were securely strapped to the device. As the ropes pull tight, the muscles and joints are pulled to their breaking point. Torture was an everyday occurrence in the 16th century, a bloody era when religious wars shook England. Among the most accomplished practitioners in the art of torture was actually a cleric, Bishop Edmund Bonner. And although he was a man of God, Bonner enjoyed inflicting pain. But say this for him, Bonner was an equal opportunity torturer. During the reign of Protestant Henry VIII, Bonner tormented Catholics. When Henry's Catholic daughter Mary Tudor came to power, Bonner switched sides and tortured Protestants. Because his victims felt he was doing Satan's work, he earned the nickname the Devil's Dancing Bear. But Bonner was really doing the bidding of Queen Mary Tudor. When Mary succeeded her father, Henry VIII, she was a woman with an axe to grind, both metaphorically and on a rather less prosaic level. Henry VIII had divorced Mary's mother, Catherine of Aragon, declaring Mary illegitimate and outlawing the Catholic faith. Queen Mary now had the power to get her own back on her father and take revenge. She reinstated Catholicism as the only religion of England. Subjects who didn't renounce their Protestant faith soon had reason to call her Bloody Mary. History has not been kind to Mary, even though she was a remarkable character. Her mother ensured she was well educated if not actually prodigious, she was certainly extremely bright and showed typical Tudor traits in fighting for and winning the crown. But her soubriquet of Bloody Mary has stuck. But then she did do her best to earn it. If Protestants refused to become Catholics, they would be tortured. If they still refused, they would be burned at the stake as heretics. It was a medieval inquisition, and Bishop Bonner, the devil's dancing bear, was Bloody Mary's enforcer. Hiding behind religious vestments, the burly former lawyer fulfilled his dark purpose. When Mary appointed him Bishop of London in 1553, Bonner set up headquarters in the Tower of London and eagerly executed his work as heretic hunter. Queen Mary made sure Bonner had a steady supply of suspects for questioning, and he held suspects in custody until they either repented or were condemned. One way or another, he got a result. Bonner drew up a list of over 100 questions about religious beliefs. If the accused did not answer each correctly, they faced the terror of the torture chamber. Richard, I know thou hast no fault inside thyself, but hast been led astray by those of evil intent that work against Sometimes a small dose of torture was so enough to persuade his prisoners. Just holding a victim's hand over a lighted candle till the flesh blistered off frequently resulted in a quick change of mind. Other times, more elaborate methods were required. There were red hot irons and thumb screws. Bilbo's to crush the ankles, and the brakes to snap off the teeth. But the most popular instrument of torture was always the rack. Eventually, everyone broke under Bonner's relentless torment. If they were shown to be enemies of the Catholic Church, they were condemned to burn at the stake. In his first year in office, Bonner sentenced 89 men and women to be burned alive for their religious beliefs. By the beginning of 1555, there were probably no more than 200 active Protestants remaining in London, but that was 200 too many to satisfy the bloodthirsty Queen. She scolded Bonner, sending him a letter stating that he was not working fast enough, rooting out heretics. 
Eager to please his employer, Bonner redoubled his efforts. He sent out spies and finally discovered a group of Protestants who were meeting in secret. Their deacon was almost immediately arrested. One of the parishioners, Cuthbert Simpson, consoled the gathering, but he was himself then arrested on charges of attending church services in English rather than Latin, a charge that was punishable by death. Simpson was taken to the tower to be tortured, but the Protestant deacon would prove to be a challenge for the sadistic devil's dancing bear. Simpson's diary described what happened next. The following Thursday, I was commanded to give the names of those who came to the English service. I answered that I would declare nothing. In consequence of my refusal, I was set upon the rack. As the ropes pulled tight, the muscles and joints of Simpson's legs were stretched and pulled to breaking point. When Simpson passed out, he was revived. After three hours of torture, Simpson was unable to walk and had to be carried back to the cell. The following week, Simpson was brought from his cell to face Bonner again, and again he refused to name those who had worshipped with him. Simpson's forefingers were bound together and an arrow was put between them. The sharp arrow was then driven between them and Simpson had to endure the excruciating pain. Relentlessly determined to break the religious man, Bonner forced Simpson into the rack twice more. Twice more, he refused to divulge the names of his congregation. By now, even the brutal Bonner had to admit a grudging admiration for the strength of Simpson's convictions. Bonner later wrote, I affirm that if he were not a heretic, he is a man of the greatest patience that ever came before me. Thrice was he racked, and yet never have I seen him broken. Bonner might have admired Simpson's bravery, but mere strength of character alone was not enough to save Simpson from a grisly fate. Bonner had Simpson tied to the stake and burned alive on March the 28th, 1558. The brave Cuthbert Simpson joined a long line of martyrs to the cause of religious tolerance. But the Devil's Dancing Bear was nearing the end of his cruel career. It's hard not to feel an element of schadenfreude for poor old Bonner, but in medieval England, justice could swing both for you and against you, depending, as it did, on the whim of the monarch and Bonner's shocking acts were not to go unpunished. Having burned, hanged and tortured hundreds of innocent victims, Bishop Bonner, the Devil's Dancing Bear, was soon asked to face his own moment of truth. When his benefactor, 
Queen Mary died in 1558 in St James's Palace, having condemned over 280 Protestants to the stake, her younger sister, Queen Elizabeth, became queen. Religious persecutions stopped. Bonner was arrested and sentenced to life imprisonment in the tower. Now the once torturer of the tower was a prisoner there himself. For almost a decade, Bonner could contemplate the 450 people he had tortured and killed in the name of God. Surrounded by squalor and filth, the devil's dancing bear died in 1569. But Bishop Bonner was only one in a long line of torturers, executioners and murderers who stalked the halls of the Tower of London. Bonner fully realised that the Tower was an intimidating place to visit, let alone be held captive. But then intimidation was one of the main reasons why the Tower was built. When the Normans invaded England, led by William, Duke of Normandy, they wanted to stamp their authority on the country as quickly and forcibly as they could. William wanted to physically intimidate the populace. He wanted to scare them and show them just how mighty he was. And to do that, he built the most fearsome structure the country has known, the White Tower, the keep of the Tower of London. For his capital, William wanted the strongest castle of all, a building that would symbolise his power and terrorise his subjects. That meant getting the best designer and builder he could. So, needing an architect, William looked to the large building projects of northern France and actually chose a man of God, a monk, Brother Gandalf, who, as an architect, was considered without equal. But all his work until then had been dedicated to the construction of churches and cathedrals. But the ambitious Gandalf dreamed of bigger and better religious buildings. William offered Gandalf the chance to become a bishop and design his own cathedral. But there was one catch. He had to first design and build the ambitious fortress William had in mind. Gandalf's ambition drove him to accept the offer. The man of God made a pact with the fearsome Norman conqueror. Despite his misgivings, Gandalf designed a masterful new fortress condensed into a single great tower the castle would dominate London and guard the River Thames. A perfectionist, he insisted on the best materials. Protected on two sides by the old Roman wall and the river, the remaining two sides were enclosed by a water-filled moat. The Great Tower would be virtually unassailable. For over 200 years, it was the tallest building in London. The ultimate statement telling anyone who looked just who was boss. The tower was oriented with its strongest and most impressive defences overlooking Saxon London. It would have visually dominated the surrounding area and stood out to anyone using the River Thames. However, despite all that, the tower could not keep its first prisoner securely. In 1100, the Bishop of Durham was imprisoned in the newly finished Tower of London. The bishop, a tax collector, in addition to his religious duties, was a corrupt public official. To placate the taxpayers, the king jailed the bishop on charges of extortion and bribery. Even though he was guarded by Norman knights, the bishop was allowed to keep sacks of gold for expenses and have his servants bring him food and wine. The heavy-set bishop hosted dinners in the tower's lavish banquet hall they often turned into drunken revels. But the bishop tired of his gilded cage and plotted a cunning escape. The bishop ordered a special feast and that extra casks of wine should be delivered. Brought in under the nose of the jail guards, one of the wine casks had a length of rope hidden inside. The bishop invited the tower guards to the banquet and made sure they had as much wine to drink as they wanted. But the bishop remained strangely sober. 
He waited until the guards nodded off in drunken stupors. Grabbing his sacks of gold and the rope from the wine cask, the bishop made his way to the tower wall. Securing the rope, he climbed over and started sliding down. The fat bishop had the added weight of his gold and it looked as though the rope might break, but it held and the bishop completed his slide down to freedom. Reaching the very end of the rope, he discovered it was not quite long enough, so he simply let go and fell to earth. Gathering up his coins, he hustled to a boat and made good his escape to the continent. The bishop became the first prisoner to escape from the fortress. But the bishop was an extreme rarity. More often than not, prisoners were brought by river from Westminster where they would have been tried. Crowds would gather along the riverbank to find out the verdict, to see if they would be treated to the spectacle of a public execution. The executioner would stand behind the accused on the boat, and if they were guilty, he would point the head of the axe towards their victim. If they were innocent, they would point it away. The crowds knew that if they were found guilty, there would be a public execution 48 hours later. Only the most privileged were allowed to die in private within the walls. The responsibility for looking after the prisoners was given to the yeoman warders. The most important role of the tower was the defence and security of the monarch. But as the centuries passed, so did the role of the tower and the architecture associated with it. The White Tower is on the site of the original Norman keep built by William the Conqueror. The curtain wall tower and moat were all added in the 13th century, together with a unique double drawbridge entrance. The moat was eventually drained in 1841. It had become a health risk. The water was stagnant and disease was starting to spread from it. Several wardens actually died as a result. In addition to being a palace and fortress, the tower has served as the first royal armory, royal mint, and even royal zoo. While such roles have long since moved elsewhere, there is one creature that has a very close link with the place. Ravens, of course, are a great legend within the tower. And the story goes back to the reign of King Charles II. Just after the Great Fire of London, all the ravens that were in the city left the city and came into the tower. And of course, there were so many of them that the residents of the tower, and in particular, the Royal Observer in the northeast corner of the White Tower, was being inundated with not only the droppings, but the birds and the feathers and the chicks. And so a petition was raised to Charles II to have the ravens killed off. Uh, it, firstly, he agreed. But then some bright spark came up with this old legend that said, if the ravens leave the tower, then the White Tower will collapse, and so will the monarchy. Of course, Charles, having just been reinstated on the throne after Cromwell, thought, better not push it too far, so he ordered that six ravens be kept in the tower. And we still, to this day, have six tower ravens looked after by the raven master. Beef Eater is a nickname. We've had the name for many hundreds of years and nobody honestly knows its origins. Uh, there are some people who think it derives from an old Norman word, buffetier, but that has never been proven. What we do know is that the yeoman warders of the Tower of London, right up to the 1800s, were paid part of their salary in beef. But one of the most well-known victims of the Tower was either completely innocent of any cunning or ambition, or extremely naive. Jane Grey was just 15 years old when her life was turned upside down. She landed in a nightmare where everyone, even her parents, abandoned her. Trapped in a paranoid web of intrigue, Jane's nightmare was real enough though. 
Her horrible journey included a nine-day reign as Queen of England, the shortest ever, and it included an unwanted stay in the Tower. Jane's cousin was 15-year-old King Edward VI. When he took the throne in 1547, he was weak and sickly. Six years later, the child king was near death. Because of the king's youth and illness, a group of nobles known as the Royal Council ran the kingdom. The council was run by the ambitious Duke of Northumberland. Northumberland's power was threatened because if the king should die before he could cement his position, the throne would revert to the king's elder sister, Mary. He hatched a risky plot. He would arrange a marriage between his own teenage son, Lord Guildford, and the king's cousin, Jane Grey, who was a Protestant and would keep the faith. Then Northumberland would persuade the dying king to name Jane as his heir. Northumberland would then effectively rule the country. Jane and the young Guildford knew nothing of their parents' scheme. The two teenagers who barely knew each other were told they were to become husband and wife. Jane's greedy social climbing parents jumped at the chance and eagerly agreed to the plot. The marriage was arranged. On the morning of her wedding, guests remarked she looked like a toy doll, even younger than her years. But the omens for Jane's marriage were not good. Thunder and torrential rain marred the hastily arranged wedding. After the ceremony, the couple suddenly found themselves alone, not in a world of their making at all. Jane was determined to do her duty and fulfill her role as a right and proper wife to Guildford. That night, the couple slept the sleep of the innocent, blissfully unaware of the nightmare that lay ahead. For the first few weeks of their forced marriage, the teenagers got to know each other. But less than six weeks after the wedding, Jane received startling news. A lady-in-waiting came to her bedchamber with the news that her cousin, the boy, King Edward, was severely ill. She was to go at once to her father-in-law, Lord Northumberland's estate. At Northumberland's palace, the young couple were met by a disturbing scene. As Jane wrote in her diary, Everyone began making complimentary speeches and bending their knee which made me blush. My distress increased when my parents paid homage to me. Finally, Jane's father-in-law, Lord Northumberland, told her the king was dead. For the first time, a shocked Jane was told that she was to become the Queen of England. I fell to the ground, weeping piteously for the death of the king, and cried out, the crown is not my right, and pleaseth me not. Telling her it was for the good of England, Jane's scheming parents convinced her to assume the throne. Later she wrote, I should not have accepted it. It showed a lack of prudence. The next day, Jane was taken to the tower where she was proclaimed queen. The crown was brought to her, but Jane insisted that she had not asked to see it. It was explained that the crown was going to be adjusted to fit her head. Then Jane found out that a king's crown was being fitted for her husband, Guildford. Suddenly, the whole ugly plot became clear. Her scheming father-in-law, Lord Northumberland, was using her 
to have his son Guilford become king. Jane was furious. She told the councillors they had betrayed her. She couldn't trust her parents. She was alone. I told them I will never, never allow Guilford to become king. Meanwhile, outside the tower, Princess Mary was raising an army to take the throne by force. A civil war over the crown erupted. Jane was to remain in the tower until Mary was captured. Although Jane did not know it, the 15-year-old would never set foot outside the fortress walls again. As Jane passed her days and nights quietly in the tower, across England, the entire country began to take sides for either Mary or Jane. The stakes were high and the price of failure was death. Jane was now in the eye of the storm. At the time, powerful noblemen were able to raise their own militia. Northumberland gathered soldiers and set off to try and defeat Mary and her followers. If he failed, he knew he would pay with his life. As the desperate Northumberland battled back in London, his scheme was unravelling and support for Mary was growing. The council began to question their decision, making Jane queen. Jane had become a liability. In a desperate attempt to save themselves, the council switched their support to Mary Tudor as their rightful monarch. They declared Northumberland a traitor and Jane a usurper. Jane's time as queen was up. Word was sent to Jane's father that his daughter must give up the crown, which only 10 days earlier she had tried so hard to refuse. On hearing the news, Jane said to her father, I much more willingly take it off than I put it on. Please, may we go home now? Her father didn't answer. Northumberland was defeated by Mary's army and taken prisoner. Jane's parents fled the tower, leaving their daughter behind. Jane was arrested for treason and was left in the tower a prisoner, along with her teenage husband, Guilford. A triumphant Mary Tudor took the throne as Queen of England and began plotting her revenge on everyone who had kept her from power. Jane's father-in-law, Northumberland, paid for his treason with his head. But even Bloody Mary could not believe that Jane Grey was a traitor. The teenager had simply been a pawn in a massive game of power politics. Jane knew that she had to stand trial for treason. But Jane had been given the Queen's word that she and her husband would be pardoned. Jane's thoughts were with her husband. If it be your will, Lord, let me be pardoned. But above all, let my husband be spared. Everything might have gone according to plan if Jane's father had not foolishly raised an army to return his daughter to the throne. Jane's father and his army seized the south bank of the River Thames. He demanded the tower and his daughter and that the new Queen Mary should surrender to him. When Queen Mary refused, he actually bombarded the tower with his own daughter inside. He was endangering his daughter's life as well as that of the Queen. Jane's fate, though, was sealed. The innocent teenager now had to die to end the plots against the new queen. Jane's fate was sealed. She had a chance to see her doomed beloved husband Guilford, but unable to face the pain, she refused to meet him. To meet him would weaken our resolve to meet our deaths. We must postpone our meeting 
until we meet in a better world where our happiness will be eternal. From her cell, the teenager watched her young husband led to the scaffold. She remained at the window until his headless body was carried back. For the first time, she broke down and wept. Now, it was Jane's turn to face the executioner. A pawn in the struggle for the throne, she walked bravely from her cell to the scaffold on Tower Green. As she mounted the steps, Jane remained brave and calm. But her priest and her ladies-in-waiting broke down and wept. When Jane knelt down and tied a handkerchief around her eyes, she reached for the block, but it was beyond her reach, and for the first time she panicked. Where is it? Where is it? I don't know what to do. Oh dear God. Everyone on the platform froze in horror. Finally, one of the crowd mounted the steps of the scaffold and placed the hands of the terrified girl on the block. Lord, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Lady Jane Grey was executed on February the 13th, 1558. The 15-year-old queen had reigned for just nine days. Through the centuries, those who were trapped in the Tower of London fought to get out. Now, instead of fighting to get out, crowds line up to get in, and the warders who once led the prisoners to be executed on the block now act as tour guides and entertain school parties where the gallows used to stand and brutal beheadings took place. The walls of the tower have withstood a thousand years of deadly struggles and treacherous plots attempted invasions, the overthrow of monarchs. The tower stands as a fierce symbol of royal might and a reminder of the tragic fate that befell those that attempted to challenge the king's power. Now, only the ravens that live in the tower are confined to these ancient walls. Legend has it that if the birds depart, the tower and the kingdom will fall so their wings are clipped to keep them lifelong prisoners inside the Tower of London.